Hello, everyone, and welcome to a brand new episode of The Financial Confessions with me, your host, co-founder and CEO of The Financial Diet and person who loves to talk about money, Chelsea Fagan. Today, I have an interview guest who is a bit of a departure from the kinds of people that we normally speak to because often we talk about building up your financial life from a place of stability or at least from some kind of financial foundation. But there are a lot of people in the world who come into adulthood basically from zero, not just in terms of savings, but in terms of their entire financial education. And one of the contexts in which people have all kinds of financial and professional struggles that most of us would probably never be aware of um, are people who come from very insular communities. A lot of the times those might be religious communities, but as we all know, if we like watching documentaries like I do, uh, it can be any kind of thing, although a lot of them tend to be religious. Do we count Nexium as religious? What was Nexium? Whatever Nexium Whatever. was, those people seriously needed a lot of financial help leaving. But all of that is to say, when you leave any kind of insular community, every element of the financial and professional world is something to be learned. Several years ago, I happened to see an interview on YouTube. I honestly have no idea how it ended up in my algorithm. It was just there uh, one day. And I watched it, and I found it super compelling. And it actually featured an interview with my upcoming guest talking about how he left his community. He happened to leave uh, the Hasidic community in Borough Park, Brooklyn, which is, I don't know how familiar you guys are with New York, but I live in Manhattan, although I used to live in Williamsburg, so I lived in Brooklyn as well. Um, but another borough here in New York left at the age of 18 and has now fairly recently completed his PhD in immunology and lives in the DC area. So completely changed his life um, from how he was raised, but obviously a huge part of that journey um, was one of discovery, and I can only imagine challenges entering the secular world and the world of everyone kind of having to hustle to make that dollar. So I wanted to talk to him for a particularly interesting conversation on leaving a community in a financial perspective, and he was gracious enough to grant me that interview. So without further ado, my guest, Sam Katz. Hello, Sam. Hey, Chelsea. Um, I'm excited for this. I have had the chance and I get asked to talk about this, but never from this angle. So it even got me reflecting on it because I've never looked at it purely through that lens. So um, I'm, I'm interested in what I'm going to say too. <laughs> yeah, me too. You know, part of the reason I really wanted to speak to um, to you, and full disclosure, we're also looking to speak uh, with another person, a woman from another community, because I do think gender probably plays huge roles, especially in communities um, that are religious in nature. Um, but I think one of the things that always strikes me, because I watch like basically any documentary or fictionalized series about this sort of situation, I completely devour. And one of the things that always strikes me that I feel like never really gets addressed is how much finances are part of what keep people in communities and what make it very, very difficult to leave. And I feel like that very rarely gets addressed because I think generally in media, we don't look a lot at the financial or class aspect of any given situation. So can you talk to us first a little bit about how you came to leave your community and what role just kind of top level finances played in that yeah I so as, as, as you mentioned I, I grew up in the in the traditional Hasidic community and you know what people always find interesting when I tell them the story is always and they when we talk about education I did or didn't get and they always find it surprising that boys don't get a general education or what you might call a secular education and girls do and I think people associate, you know, religious insular communities with less education for girls. But the reason it is that way in the Hasidic community is the expectation is that men will stay studying God's word and serve God through that maintaining a kind of a full schedule of, of, of religious activity, while the women will go out in the world and often be the breadwinners. I mean, that became a little less common in the last couple of years and depends between families. But the women are really kind of expected that they're going to go to work in addition to having, you know, seven to eight kids and, and raising them. And so the girls, you know, they get their uh, they take the regents exam, which I believe is the New York exam, whereas boys don't get any of that. Girls speak English amongst themselves, whereas boys speak Yiddish amongst themselves and girls speak Yiddish when they speak to men. So 
from the start, you already kind of get a sense of how you are expected in the kind of financial thinking. But I grew up in that in that in that style. I, I attended yeshivas my whole life. Around at age 10, my parents separated, which was very uncommon in the community back then. It's gotten slightly more common. It's still pretty uncommon, but it was pretty uncommon back then. And one of the ways in which you kind of stay in check within the community is you will be assigned a match by a matchmaker. And the way the matchmaking works is what I like to call there's a blemish calculator <laughs> where they decide how many blemishes your family has and you can only get you know, of equal and lesser value. And you don't want to do anything bad when you're young, because let's say if you're a boy and you were caught, you know, one day when you st should be studying out, you know, having fun or, or hanging out in a the park, they're like, oh, there's rumors that he's not as serious. And that really affects you for your life because the better student you are, the richer a father-in-law you get. Because if you're a good student, you want, you get a father-in-law who will support you for the rest of well, if you're a great student the rest of your life, often nowadays it'll be, you know, 10 years or five years that you can like study without having to worry about it. And maybe they'll cover your apartment for a while. So that really keeps you in check because why take the risk? It'll really ruin it for you. But then when my parents separated, I was already damaged goods because I'm considered a broken family. So you can only get someone else from either a broken family or somebody with a disability or that's kind of the way it works. So that check on my life kind of fell away. And, but I was still very devoutly religious, following the rules. You know, my father's a rabbi, my mother's father's a rabbi. That was the path I was going to go in. And as, you know, around, uh, the, my parents' divorce was quite messy for as many divorces are, mostly financial reasons, but I think the finances were just a way to express emotional hurt and anger. Uh, so that was a pretty messy divorce. And then I stayed growing up with my mom, my two sisters. And my mother was even for the community we grew up in, we were considered quite on the lower financial end, I would say on the poorer side. Um, we were like in a one bedroom, you know, four people. So later we had to move, we moved, we couldn't afford within the community. So we lived right on the border. So literally the other side of the tracks where there's the above ground one and things were very tough at home. So I, and because of the religious setting, even though there were two people older than me in the household, I had to lead a lot of the things, you know, the Sabbath meal and everything. So that kind of put a lot on me and I needed an escape. And the Brooklyn public library was right outside where we lived because there wasn't one inside the community. There was just one right outside. And because I lived so far, I was like, I can go there. So I started bettering my English uh, going there. I mean, we had school from seven in the morning to nine at night. So the only day you can go is Friday because you finish early for the Sabbath. Um, so I would go there. I got shot in the chocolate factory, you know, I was about like 15, read it with a dictionary, figured stuff out. And I wasn't gonna touch any of the like non-kosher books or anything. Um, but I mostly just kept the children's books. And then once my English got better, I thought, well, science is bad. So I'm not going to look at any of those stuff, but I want to be a rabbi. Psychology sounds relatable. So I started reading a lot about that, had no clue about Freud or where any of those things can go. <laughs> and I, I read a lot of stuff without knowing anything what they were talking about, but that became kind of a lifeline as things were kind of tough at home. Um, and I, you know, just to try and decide on the level of detail to give, but uh, pretty soon I ended up becoming more curious about the world and slowly my faith kind of crumbled. At around age 16, I was given the offer to go study in Israel at a very competitive yeshiva. Usually you go at around 18. And if you study in Israel for a while, that raises your marriage stock. So I thought it was worth it. When there and there, I really lost all my kind of faith. I became very interested in science, very interested in reading and began dreaming of a life in college and would sneak out on internet cafes and that kind of thing and realized I need the GED, which is the equivalency degree. So I told my family I wanted to leave. They said, absolutely not. So I was stuck there. 
Um, and that was a little bit of a saga. But then at 18, I just said, I'm coming home. So I came home to visit for the holiday of Passover and just said, I'm not going back. So that's, that's pretty much when I left it. I, I don't, I can't say I thought about money much at that time. Um, most of the things I was using were public resources, you know, libraries. I was studying for the GED and libraries using their stuff. And I was still what we would call at that time living the double life, which is, you know, you still on the outside look you're part of the community, but secretly you're not. So I was still dressed the proper way so I could still live at home. And I was basically just, you know, living, I guess you can call it the lie or the compromise. Um, so yeah, I did that and I ended up reaching out. This is a sidetrack, but uh, in, the, in, the, in, in New York, in order to get your equivalency degree, you need a discharge letter from the last high school you attended. But I didn't exist in the Department of Education because the Department of Education in New York just looks the other way and just pretend it doesn't exist, kind of like with the polygamy in Utah or, or other sign of contexts. So I couldn't get a letter, so I found this uh, organization called The Door, which is a youth center for like, in, and they have children of, you know, uh, unresolved immigration statuses or children of homelessness. And if you get into that program, you can take the test through them. So I went there and I took the test through them. I mean, that was a very you know, real culture shock. Um, you know, in, in order to get the GD there, you also have to have like sex ed, conflict resolution, know your rights and all of these other uh, things, which was really, really, uh, was really a culture shock. But yeah, they really helped me. They gave me like support for like Metro cards and those kinds of things and then helped me with my SATs. And then I went to college. So that, that more or less is the path. I don't know how much that covers. Um, and when you went to college, when you left your community, um, how did you support yourself? Yeah, so I, I went to a public university. I went to Stony Brook. And there's an organization in New York called Footsteps, which supports people who left the community. And they gave me a scholarship. Um, I did FAFSA and all of that, and I had it. And then I had a couple of loans. My family was still giving me a hundred a month. So that was kind of the little change. But before I went to college, I worked for a year. So I, I, in between getting my GED to going to college, I worked in animal husbandry, which is running animal facilities and research centers. So breeding a lot of mice and getting really good at telling at a really early stage whether the mouse is male or female. Um, because you need a lot of male mice in X chromosome research. But anyway, um, so I was basically just, I worked there for a year and I was still living at home because I still had the whole religious look and everything. So I saved all of that money and that kind of kept me for about a year uh, while I was in college and the rest was was loans. So... So during that time, there was a sounds like a several year period where your family was aware that you were no longer religious, but they let you live in their house as long as you kept looking a certain way. Yeah, I mean, I was quite lucky, you know, there was never a kind of hard line of like, you know, you can't, we're, we're going to disown you that I don't think that ever was on the table for me. And I, I think it's less common than a lot of old Yiddish novels have. And to be frank, a lot of the TV and movies that are being made of, I think it's easier to tell a story of like a clean cut. And I think for a lot of, and, and me and my friends who have similar experience talk a lot about it. What's more often happening is more of a complicated kind of dance you have with your family. Of Some parts are like, don't ask, don't tell. Some parts are you're accepted. Some part, you know, is a third rail and you don't touch. And I think that is more common what happens, at least with my group of people that I've gotten to know. And that kind of happened with me. You know, I, I told them that I want to go to college, but never had the conversation about my religiosity. Um, word came back to them about some of the things I was doing, you know, from some people who were hearing. But I think this is a bit of a more of a difficult 
um, <laughs> a difficult topic, but I'll try to add some levity to it. Um, but when you, you know, my mom is a strong person of faith, so she doesn't think of me as somebody who is not religious. She thinks of me as someone who's temporarily not religious. Like, I will come back, you know? So that kind of creates a certain connection. And I made, you know, I was also deciding how much financial connection I want to have because in my back of my mind, I'm like, I'm going to disappoint them because I'm not coming back. And to be honest, I didn't have that conversation with my mother until I, my weekend before leaving for college because I was going to cut off the pious, the cycles you have. And that's like a hard cut. And that was like one of the most direct conversations we've had. But, you know, in my mom's mind, you know, I'm, <laughs> this is actually funny, like, a year ago, I showed her an episode of Queer Eye, um, and that was very new to her. She did, and she found Jonathan Van Ness very, very fascinating. So at some point, and you know, I'm straight, and I asked her, I was like, "Mom, like, would you rather I was religious but I was gay, or if I'm straight but I'm not religious as now?" And I teased her because I have two sisters. I was like, "Mom, you'd have three son-in-laws." Um, but then she thought about it for a minute, and then she says, "You know." as you are now, because if you were gay and religious, I couldn't, you wouldn't, I couldn't hope that you would change. But now I think you still can come back, which is weirdly progressive and weirdly made me sad um, that that's kind of, so I think that kind of dynamic, you know, it's never been a real hard cut with my family, but you always feel like you're on borrowed time before less deniability is possible. Um, so for the first uh, year that I was working in animal husbandry, and so I still had the look, still had everything, I'm sure they had a sense I wasn't as religious as it seemed, but I think the hope was, you know, I, I remember when I came back from Israel, I came back to visit for the holiday, and I was surprised that my mom was totally fine, I, I expected her to see her devastated, and it wasn't until the date when all the boys who were supposed to go back went back that I wasn't that she started responding because up to that point she had faith that I would be on that plane so I think that kind of hope and faith and religiosity makes you have a weird tie with your family um so while I was there I mean I I had <laughs> interestingly they my mom would want to give me money to like food because she thought that's a bigger chance that I eat kosher but I kind of had to push that a little bit but for for college, by the time I went to college I think it was out in the open and then I was pretty much kind of just you know I was honestly figuring it out I I didn't know much about college finances or or any of those things but I was kind mm -hmm. of I was kind of winging it <laughs> mm. yeah I'm you know it's funny I feel I think most compelled by the topic of insular communities I actually uh gonna blur as many details as I possibly can here but have a family member who was a part of an insular community for a while was actually non-religious but okay. uh yeah um and it was not a great experience for the rest of us let me let me say that much but what was super fascinating about it to me and I think that was partially what kind of kicked off my interest in it was um how quickly um, the sort of in-group versus out-group dynamic is used to um, really kind of be a source of power and control um, and how often money is tied up with that, whether it's, you know, only being able to seek employment within a community or relying on others in the community for your financial sustainability. But there's also a dynamic that what you were just talking about kind of makes me think of, which is a sort of separation from the rest of the world um, based on um, the things that you start to do and what you start to believe. And, and for an example, um, you know, I, I don't have the data um, on me at this moment, but I've been reading a lot lately about how in, um, a, com in a community like the United States that's increasingly politically polarized, um, extremist groups of all kinds tend to become more popular. Um, and I feel like what we're seeing now is this big push towards, um, you know, I consider myself a member of, you know, sort of the progressive wing of politics, a push towards really cutting off people who are not um, in agreement with that sort of ideological orthodoxy. You mentioned, of course, your mom having 
let's just say, not perfectly woke views on gay people, uh, which is not a surprise given um, her background. Um, But there are a lot of people, I think, especially more and more today, who would encourage you to not have a relationship with her because of all of these things that she believes. And I worry that that tends to become almost a self-perpetuating cycle that increases people heading towards um, uh, isolating themselves. Yeah, absolutely. Like I, the thing I always say, you know, I grew up every day thanking God that I am not a Gentile, so not a non-Jew, not a slave and not a woman. And then I am who I am today. So you have to have faith in, in, in people's capacity to change. And I, and I see it even now. So when I made my transition and that was around 2008 and the big uh you know you know i don't know if you ever have that moment where you're like discover something and you're into something i feel like that's probably what showing up at woodstock felt like and then you realize like that was the popular thing to do then and you're kind of feel a little less special (laughs) um so i think when i was kind of questioning my faith was when you know the new atheists were very popular in publishing. So like Richard Dawkins wrote The God Delusion, Christopher Hitchens wrote God is Not Great, Sam Harris wrote Letter to a Christian Nation. And they were kind of the big thinkers. And I'll be honest, their books had a big impact on me. But then they kind of shifted and now kind of become in, I don't want to, I don't want to guess the label, but they're a bit more on the, on the, on, you know, they're a, a quarter Peterson, a Jordan Peterson on the Jordan Peterson scale, I think. Um, and I see it now with people who are questioning the faith that I grew up in, who I'm very close friends with. And a lot of them are in the left woke side who kind of interpret their skepticism and the cynicism that it took them to reject their faith to a cynicism to reject new ideas or new identities particularly when it comes to transgender issues, seems to be the hot rod thing. Um, So, and I'm friends with a lot of them and I often question it, you know, should I, you know, should I call them out? And I, I, I inform them on my opinion, but I, I can't, I can't, you know, if it's someone I don't have a connection with, it's one thing, if it's a stranger on the internet, I suppose, but I, I just can't justify, you know, rejecting someone for for their you know I mean obviously there are beliefs I can't stand by but I think our beliefs are in flux and I don't know our, our only hope is communities like I mean I always think when I see people who go through this experience of questioning their faith and then it ends up translating into uh, a rejection of of big ideas, kind of this fetishization of of westernized secularism of the Enlightenment era, you know, which was was good, but it's not the only good in the world. And it ended up turning into that. And you know, but I don't, you know, but for the grace of of, of God or 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 you know, you know, that could have been me. So I, I always have a soft spot for for people who are work, working through their thought processes. I, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, you know, I, I am friends with people who, who say things that, you know, honestly make me cringe. I mean, I'm in the science space, so you get a lot of those kind of, you know, I don't know what to call them. I mean, they're basically eugenicists, but they like talking about, we need to talk about code influence on IQ and genetics um and it's 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 terrifying because i mean i i always tell my scientific friends i mean you know the history our role as scientists in history of eugenics is something we really need to own and you hear it seep in every now and then and i just can't become the person who says well i can't talk to you if you believe that way it's just you know (laughs) i have the image of the people who said that to me so yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm with you on that one. There's a lot to unpack there, quite honestly. I mean, the the thing about the new atheists, I mean, talk about like they could have just stayed playing the hits, but I feel like they went way, way too far into the like, yeah, I don't think I think most uh, fundamentalist religions probably are a net negative to communities, especially women. Um, but 
Does that mean that the answer is demonizing, for example, billions of Muslims? I, I feel like that's clearly not the answer. Um, but it's interesting when it comes to sort of excommunicating people um, who don't subscribe to a particular um, sociopolitical orthodoxy. You know, I feel this is something I feel very strongly about. And again, kind of to be as delicate as possible. If you've ever had a, a loved one or a family member who has been a part of a very radical community, whether that's religious, political, um, or even just sort of secular but kooky as hell, as some of them are, um, you really quickly understand that if you completely cut them off or you shame them or you mock and ridicule them, you are doing exactly what the extremists or their community want you to be doing, right? You're really reinforcing this view that they're fed, which is that there's us and there's everyone else, right? And everyone else is dangerous and bad and they hate you already. So why would you want to play into them? They'll never truly accept you. Um, and the only answer is to, you know, obviously you can kind of stand firm in the things that are, you know, important not to waver on ethically. You can rebut, you can, um, you know, say how you feel, but you have to do it with empathy and you have to keep, you have to keep a door open to them being able to change their mind, um, which is humiliating and devastating for people to say I was wrong, to say, you know, I shouldn't have felt this way, or I at least shouldn't have acted the way I did, um, and we see it now, I think most people are, are are most kind of aware of it right now with politics because there are a lot of politics, I feel like, especially in sort of mainstream progressive discourse, we've sort of drawn a line under a certain point on the chart. And we're like, anyone who's below this, fuck them, basically. Like they can, they can go to hell and there's no room for redemption. And, you know, obviously a, a lot of our sort of like the, I hate this word, but the kind of cancellation and the problematic discourse and all of that feeds into it. But I really don't think a lot of people realize just how close political radicalization is to a lot of other types of radicalization and how much otherizing and sort of driving people out um, plays exactly into the hands of the worst actors. Yeah. And I, you know, the sad thing is when I reflect on the community I came from and what led to them being such a community and my interpretation, and I am certainly not a you know, scientific anthropologist or <laughs> one of my <laughs> peeves, I always, I always feel like this is a sidetrack, but I almost feel like, you know, kind of when they, they, when you become a medical doctor, you have to make the oath do no harm. And I feel like PhDs should have to say, I will never claim my PhD title unless it's exactly the topic for which I got it from. So I, I definitely don't want to claim any expertise in, in something outside my field. But the community I came from, you know, was built after the Holocaust, built after World War II. And I always, you know, I always say, if you want to understand any Jewish community, just look at what they blame the Holocaust on. So if you think of the Israeli Zionist one, you know, they were like, we were lied, we didn't have an army, we relied on others, we can never be as vulnerable. So they made a state, they made an army. And if you look at the Americanized assimilated one, you know, they said, the reason this happened was, we stood out too much, we were too weird, too different, let's change our names, assimilate, it won't happen again. And the community I came from said, you know, you can never again trust the outside. You can never again trust the outside world. They're utterly dangerous to you. And that response built us that community. And now the, you know, what, what happened as a defense mechanism is now something that not only encourages uh, distancing and othering and, 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 and gaps between other people, but it really, you know, breaks families and breaks all these kinds of relationships. So it kind of, you know, I do kind of get that view on the outside and I always wonder, you know, am I overly cautious on it? Because a lot of the language of, you know, if you think like this, you know, you have no place here. And it's happened to me. I got to that growing up. You know, but on the other hand, where is the line? You know, something that happened in the community I grew up in, when I grew up, you know, internet was access to a desktop, you know, which isn't that long ago. Um, so they really were able to control access to the internet. In order to attend school, you have to sign that you, have, you don't have a computer at home. So there was no kind of, as the internet came up, you know, there was no education on how to use it or what are the different sources, what is the hierarchy of information. And then smartphones came and they just couldn't stem the control of it. 
So now everybody has WhatsApp, everybody has internet on the phone, but without that kind of breaking in of how the internet works and what is different information sources. And it's made the community become almost one that I don't even recognize. And there's some reason became very aligned with right-wing politics. Mm -hmm. um, this actually, again, the, uh, a little bit of a financial side of it. You know, we were generally known to vote Democrat because the community really survives on government funding. So whether it is food stamps, whether it's Section 8 for housing, whether it's weird ways of getting around the government supporting the schools, even though the schools don't really follow the rules. So they generally vote Democrat. And that was true as I was growing up. And in the last couple of years, and if you look at maps of the general election, it really became red and right wing radio somehow got in. And we can, you know, my my theory about it is that the kind of bombastic, uh, assertive talking is very similar to the kind of fire and brimstone religious sermons. So mm. I think it's an easier leap than a very soft talking NPR voice. Um, to, to get that, but it's definitely there. And I remember, you know, one of the moments when I realized the community has changed when was right after the George Zimmerman trial, which was on a Saturday. I was visiting family. I was at an uncle's home and it was the Sabbath, so they couldn't get the news. And then the Sabbath ended at nightfall and they saw that Zimmerman was, uh, I don't want to say exonerated, um, found not guilty, I suppose. And there was like celebration. And I was like, where, where did that come from? So I think in a weird way, the, the separation that that community felt from the world and the separation that a lot of certain political thinking is feeling right now is meshing in a certain way. Mm. Um, and I, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I don't like being dramatic, but it is worrying. Um, and I, you know, I don't know the answer, you know, me still being friendly to someone changes it, but. Yeah. I mean, there are no easy answers and I mean, not to take it back to capitalism, um, which is usually sort of the, uh, end of the line of each of these episodes, but as we see quality of life diminish for the middle class, as we see people become more and more alienated from, you know, the fruits of their productivity and people have to struggle harder and harder to live a good life and um, people feel more and more economically marginalized, you know, extremist groups of any kind are going to have an appeal. And moreover, um, you know, the right wing evangelical radio um, which is definitely not new, although I think has uh, a new kind of pervasiveness with the internet. Um, it offers really simple and satisfying answers to really complicated problems. Um, and that's going to appeal to everyone. But in terms of the finances of it, um, you know, I'm curious how you view uh, finances as being a tool of control and of conformity in communities like yours. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, one of the ways in which I was incredibly lucky, which is I left right at 18. So at 18, they start talking for you to getting a match. They want to find a matchmaker to pair you up. And I already knew I was out. I told them, like, don't do it. It'll cause embarrassment. There's no way I'm going for it. Um, one of the fastest way, and, and they want you to get married fast, because once you're married fast, you have big financial responsibilities. And your only way to meet them is through help with the community because you have no resume, you have no skills. I mean, I don't wanna undermine the what studying Talmud and the thinking it makes you develop, but that's not the world, the, the, the labor market we are in. You know, not a lot of people asking the laws of an ox killing a bull in the 14th century. So there's something transferable about it, but not enough. And they really want you to get married and stay within the community. And so many people I leave say to me, I have, you know, at this point, three to four kids, by the time you realize you want to leave, the only way I can stay is by working within the community, working through people who know me. So if any of you live in New York, you know, a very popular place where you see a lot of Hasidic people in Manhattan is B&H Photo. B&H Photo was started by a Hasidic man uh, from the sect that I was from. His nephew was my study partner and he hires Hasidic men uh, women as well. Um, if you pay attention, uh, he usually hires women in 
accounting and offices and usually men in the sales force, but he sprinkles them occasionally for the HR purposes. Um, but they hire a men without those skills, but you got to be on the in to get that. You know, it's, mm. it's not going to work other, any other way. So there's these little uh, built up, a lot of uh, Jewish food processing plants will hire you. That's the way people do business. And there's ways where people will just lift you up. And, you know, somebody who's in the real estate business will tell you, you know, I'll give you something to start. But you leave, you're out. And I've had a lot of people who I've worked with, who, I've, who have reached out to me. And the biggest block is I have, it's not just that I don't have any money to leave. I have no skills to leave. So I don't have anything that I can take out there that will help me float. So I think the, the, the and, and I remember when I was 18 and I, I told my family, that's it, I'm not going back. My grandfather called me into his study and he said, okay, after our union, he says, I will support you, just get married first. Because once they have you there, they have you on lock. Yeah. And, you know, it's, they really want that. Like, you know, and, 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 and it's known in the community, if you start showing signs of withering or questioning, they marry you off fast. And I really, and it's, you're also connected to someone, but your finances become really complicated and completely intertwined in the community. So, and I, I, I think for women, it's a bit, you know, uh, different who leave the community because, I mean, they do have a certain set of skills, but their finances and their financial things are tied up, you know, with, with the, with the men in their life um, and their families. And there's various other blockades that I, I can't speak authoritatively about, but for men, I mean, you're only being hired by somebody either like giving you something, which case you're indebted to them. So like they're giving you, maybe your father-in-law gives you some starting money to flip houses or, started very common now as Amazon businesses because you know you can keep your own schedule and nobody sees you you don't interact I worked for a while so as I was going through college to support myself I worked a lot of different jobs and even I used the Hasidic network to get jobs you know so I had a lot of different various jobs within the Hasidic community um, and it was for a year after college I worked in the plush toy industry and I worked for this two Hasidic men who started uh, selling plush toys on Amazon and then wanted to build a website. And I needed a job and, and that was around. And I remember sitting there one time in May and the guy is, tells me, are there graduations now? And I said, yes. Yeah. Oh, a lot of people are ordering beers. <laughs> and then one time it was, it, this was a uh, 2014, 2015. He said, what is Jurassic Park? And then because they, the supplier set the stock up on dinosaur stuff. So you jump into a lot of businesses and you get certain help. And the one thing I will speak to that the community gives, and I think it gives them uniquely to men, I don't think it gives it to women, which is a confidence that the world isn't as complicated as it looks. Mm. You're told like the most complicated thing is the Talmud, that's your studying, that God chose you to study and the world is designed. There are women in your life, so they will do your laundry and prepare your food so you can study. There are non-Jewish people and they're all around here. So you study God's word. And that's the most complicated thing in the world. So everything else, you know, can be too complicated. And it's something I've noticed is a bit of a secret to success in that community when they do try to go into business is they're just not very scared of things. Like if I wanted to start a plush toy company, I would like do a ton of research about whether toys are growing, whether they're overtaken now by digital or what have you. And they were like, I guess we'll try. So I think... You know, the community gives you that and you can do it with the help of the community, but it's very hard when you do it on the outside. And I'll be honest, a lot of my friends who have left, their businesses are still tied into it, you know, and they'd wear a yarmulke for guys when they still go. Um, I have female friends who still work in the community and still keep the dress code to stay there because I think even on the business side, even if they value you, they don't want to be the one who has someone who's the troublemaker. Mm -hmm. So I think it usually keeps you in line or at least keeps some line open for you there. So I think it's one of the saddest things because I, I kind of agree with the community. If you want someone to leave, you kind of need to get there early. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's really a critical moment when you decide. And if you stay there, you know, 
past your 20 or 21, you know, you have three to four or more kids relying on you and your only skill set is one that the community is willing to work with. So I think it's the drop preparedness that controls you almost as much as, as the finances itself. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in the community, it's assumed when you get married, you're going to sign up for the government support. I mean, it's just an assumption. Yeah, we'll get married. We'll go sign up. There are offices that help you sign up for it that are dedicated to that. Wow. And, you know, you'll, and, and in order to keep that, a lot of the jobs are done. I don't know if that's an expression in English. In Yiddish, we say under the table. Like if they pay you cash. So yes, it's not- under the table. Yeah. So, so there's a lot of jobs that are offered under the table so you can still make ends meet. And nobody is getting rich that way. So you can still keep those support. So you're stuck in a cycle that you really, it's really tough to get out of. And quite often, a lot of people who I meet who are in the community and want to leave and they already have families always say, I'm just waiting for the kids to get married. And another reason is because if they leave before, they ruin their children's chances at a match. And that feels like a big burden. But it's also, you know, you can maybe financially untangle yourself then. So... That yeah, that concept of sort of um, f- familial shame is is such a killer. Also, I have to say that the fact that it is such a given that you will sign up for go- government benefits or that you might work under the table, it is really fascinating how um, cultural stigmas apply to certain groups and not to others. Um, yeah. You know, we judge certain groups in the U.S. extremely harshly uh, for. Um, taking on any government benefits um, or for working in an undocumented way and don't for others. Um, And I think a lot of people tend not to realize, um, you know, obviously I think this, your community might be uh, an exception, but it is worth saying that the majority of people who, um, who use government benefits also work. um, You know, most people use it as a supplement. Um, But this is actually maybe a naive question, so feel free to just be like, no. But so your mom says she thinks you're going to come back into the fold at some point. But based on the system you described where like, you know, you go into a library or whatever could be a real strike against you in a future marriage market. I mean, you having left the community for a decade, who are you going to be marrying at that point? Like, (laughs) yeah. I, I, so I, is your question like how much going back is possible? Yeah, but because like if you go back theoretically, like isn't the shame you would bring so great that you could never functionally be part of the community? Yeah, it's it's it's. I mean, my ties were there is done. I mean, you're out. I mean, you can presumably you know come back on 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 hands and knees and you know back for it, but you're still an outsider. Nobody would want your kids for marriage unless. They have something that went wrong in their family. I think my mother's kind of faith, and also, yeah, I don't think faith is rational. Um, I've, I've sometimes like asked her, you know, I mean, I, I can say that, you know, she's she's very, she prays a lot that I marry someone Jewish. I, I have not constricted my dating to the Jewish faith or, or the Jewish identity, I should say. Um, but she prays a lot for it. And I'm always like, even by some chance, you know, the person I do, like, I wouldn't raise, and we choose to have kids, I wouldn't raise them Jewish. And she's like, you know, one thing at a time. Like, I mean, I don't think faith is, is that rational for her. Um, You can, I mean, I think for her, if I honestly, if I choose to, you know, follow the rules, even if I'm outside, like, that would be a, that would be a win for her. Um, So I think, yeah, I don't think, I think it's just, you know, I mean, she, it's, it's, it's sad because, you know, this is a, you know, a different question in which, you know, certain burdens are put on women over men. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's extra difficult for me. I'm my mom's only son, um, and, you know, and I know she was raised of like, your goal is to have sons who, you know, worship God and study. And I, I took that from her. So it's right. also something I try to be sensitive around her, you know, and I, you know, I know I shouldn't be living my life with someone else, but it's hard to know that you're someone's reason why their life didn't work out. That's yeah. So that's a bit of a, a bit of a dance. So I, I don't think any of us, you know, and that's the thing with a lot of family dynamics and even whether it's financial or emotional not everything that is known is said 
mm. you know um so a lot of things are just you know certain dances we have and and you realize a year or two in that that's kind of the agreement you've fallen into sure and, you know that's just but you don't touch so you know i don't think i you know i don't think the, i also i've given a lot of interviews about this as as you mentioned and you know i'll i'll be honest you know well let me backtrack and i know that I've heard them a lot and I, it came back to me none of them said it to me to my face but the, it got word out people told my family about it and I know it was painful for them that, you know, that their kid was the poster child of it. On the other hand, a lot of scholarships and opportunities I got was because of those. I, I just, you know, I remember when I came to, to undergrad and I wanted to get summer internships and everything. And the first few years, they want your high school GPA and you don't have one. You're not getting one. You fall out of it. And you, you can find someone in your university, but they won't have a payment or anything. So I really wasn't getting any. I was just doing all these jobs. And then once I did, I did an interview that was on All Things Considered. Mm -hmm. And then I ended up getting a fellowship at the University of Michigan. And, and the person who I ended up going with told me, like, I saw the interview. It was, I was really intrigued. And this is a, I don't know how true it is for other people, but I suspect it is for other people who have left. Your story kind of becomes your currency. And it really is a way in which, you know, obviously in the traditional way in which your college application essay is useful, but you also use it as a certain way to open a door that you're kind of is a bit close to you that you kind of need to get in on. So, you know, the presence of my interviews of that way, using it in certain applications and certain scholarships to get and also getting certain awards. Your, your story kind of becomes what opens your door. And I mean, it messes with you a bit because you start resenting it and right. you kind of feel tired of it. I mean, I'm sure we all get tired of the spiel of our life that we give and then feel like, you know, does someone see me? Um, so, but it certainly has done it for me. And I, you know, and so for me, you know, those stories that I did and the way I've been outspoken, it's also, you know, I know it made an impact for other people. Sure. You know, I did an interview on... NBC on Brian Williams old show and I ended it with saying you know they asked me what do you want to say to people in the community and I said um, and I really worked hard on that line but I tried to make it sound <laughs> natural like kind of like I'm pretty sure Neil Armstrong you know workshop the one step for a man kind of thing and it was like oh, I'm going to deliver that it's gonna it's gonna work <laughs> so I said you know if you're unhappy I'm not saying you should leave this life I'm not saying you would but if you want, you could, you know, and that kind of became the thing. And I did that interview. There was, you know, family was hurt. I thought I got something out of it. I got some use out of it. And like two years ago, I was in Mexico, just traveling on my own. And I suddenly get this, uh, you know, in Messenger, when you don't, you are not a friend, they say somebody wants to send you a message. Mm -hmm. And it's this message from this guy. And it said, I've been thinking of saying this to you, but I thought, you know what? I might as well just say it. And two voice notes. And I'm like, what's that going to be? And I'm sitting there. I was, asking, I was actually literally in a mezcal bar there. And I listened to it. And this person tells me that they grew up in the city community and they first finally got a cell phone a couple of years ago. And the first thing they were curious was, what do other people know about us? Because you're so, you only know your world. And you're like, do they even know or that kind of thing? And he looked it up and my interview came up and he said, in the end, you said that if you think it does make you happy, it could. And that really moved him and he left and he just now got into music school. He's studying music and he wanted to let me know. So, you know, how do I balance the impact that speaking out makes with the very real hurt it does for people incredibly close to me? Um, and how do I value the impact it does for me? Like, I mean, right now, I mean, I, I've gotten to establish myself in my field and I, I'd like to think the things I get in my work now are the, your average mix of talent, luck and privilege like everyone else. <laughs> but at least in the beginning, it was the story. So how do you balance doing that? You know, when the thing that's opening doors for you is kind of you know, causing pain and definitely close some doors. I mean, after that interview, my, my mother's parents don't talk to me anymore. 
Um, mm-hmm. And I have some aunts and uncles. I mean, I, I joke that, you know, my mom is one of eight, my father is one of seven, so I can afford to lose a few aunts and uncles. <laughs> I still have a big family. But uh, it's, you know, I don't know how, you know, I, I don't have the answer. And when people who start, you know, asking me, like, should I do this media event? Should I do this engagement? And I'm like, it will open doors for you, but it yeah. will hurt, you know, for people back home. I, I don't know the answer. I mean, I hear you. I think obviously at a different, it's at a different level, but the idea of being honest about your experience uh, and being somewhat opportunistic in that honesty versus um, upsetting uh, family is an extremely common theme when it comes to talking about finances. I actually... Oh, interesting. Not to self-plug, but I highly recommend uh, my interview with Ashley C. Ford on the topic. She actually has a memoir coming out very soon. Um, She grew up in poverty. Um, Her father was incarcerated for, I think, the first 30 years of her life. Um, And when she talks about growing up in, you know, serious financial insecurity and all of those struggles and the struggles um, that having an incarcerated parent um, represented, um, it's really, really difficult for her mom because her mom always worked. She managed to bust her ass and scrape by with, I think, four kids, three, four kids um, uh, as a single mom, um, you know, also probably doing, I think, some stuff to support her um, her husband who was incarcerated or her um, partner. I'm not sure if they were married at the time, but suffice to say it was a real kind of um, a source of embarrassment. I similarly, my parents um, struggled quite a lot financially when I was young and um, it's definitely not their favorite thing for me to talk about. Um, and, you know, all of that. Uh, and we did recently also an interview um, with a woman who speaks um, specifically to first generation Americans about um, their finances. And of course, the sort of immigrant parent to first gen kid experience, I think, is another area that's very sensitive in terms of um, the child's experiences versus the parents. And also, you know, to what extent I think the real question is to what extent is each person really owed the right to their own experience and their own story. Um, And I do feel that especially for adult children of any kind of complicated situation, and obviously yours is a much more extreme case, but I think in general, something that we try to um, communicate here at TFD is um, you have to, to some degree, liberate yourself from the um, feelings that your truth might bring up for someone else. Now, obviously, if you're saying something else, like I would never share um, a family member's experience that wasn't mine um, or talk about things that don't uh, impact me um, because that's not my story to tell. And I think that's where there is a lot of sort of ethical issues. But if you're speaking in honesty about your own experience, I do feel like there's a place, there's a point in adulthood where you kind of have to liberate yourself from um, the the weight that that truth might have on others, as long as it's being shared in an, in an empathetic way. Yeah, that's that's really fascinating because I've never thought about it in the kind of financial context. But you know, it comes down to how do you speak compassionately about things your parents didn't give you. Because, right, the default is that it is a condemning voice. Right. Um, and I, 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 you know, I don't blame my parents for the education they didn't give me. They grew up in a world, did what they believed was right. Um, but how do you talk about long-term consequences of choices your parents made that are impacting you? And I think you're right. The only way... It, it changes, you know, is, you know, the the communication of people who have similar things kind of raising each other's consciousness on it. You know, that's something you give your peers and what your, what your parents don't give you, your peers don't give you. <laughs> it right. just reminds me with the, the community I grew up in had a big meeting years ago in New York to kind of discuss the dangers of the internet. And they took out... Uh, I'm terrible. I didn't grow up with sports. I don't know. Oh, I don't know if I'll be much help, but truly the blind leading the blind through this, but go ahead. Yes. Like the, the big stadium in New York. I don't know which one they took out a very big one. Um, all I remember is they had, there was a big, the, the John Batron had like an ad for hot sauce. And there was like this woman, I don't know, maybe Mexican woman photo on it. So they had to put big white 
sheets on it. So there's no photo of a woman there. Oh but so if you all know the stadium that has an ad for hot sauce, that's the one. But they had a huge meeting about the dangers of the internet. And I was so tempted to go there and write, the internet gave me the education you didn't. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, that this, you know, there's gaps that you've given me and what I'm doing out here is filling them. Yeah. So, and, and even as I'm, you know, talking now, you know, in the beginning of my journey, the big issue was, you know, you didn't give me a high school education. I, you know, the first time I saw a Scantron was in my GED test. I've never seen such a thing in my life. We just didn't have tests. It was all decided on whatever the dean of the school's impression of you was, which fosters its own kind of psychological control and messed upness. But, you know, I was, I was thrown into that world, didn't know anything, you know, with college, I felt unready. Now, as I'm getting to kind of establishing my professional life, and I'm realizing the things that were true in the community that are not true in my life now. So particularly around financial planning, you know, I mean, retirement was not something really discussed in the community, because you just, you don't, first of all, you, you, most people aren't earning the kind of money to build retirement funds, but also you're supported by your family or the community. I mean, the network of the community is incredible. I mean, it really is um, the support network that they have internally. So those things were not really discussed. Home ownership was a thing way out for, for people, um, for certain segment of the, of the community that had certain kind of money, either inherited or something like that. But Nobody in my family did it mean my grand, one grandparent had a home that they bought years ago um, in Williamsburg, but, you know, home ownership didn't exactly translate to most of us. And, you know, I, I arrived at, a, at graduate school and we were talking about our stipends and somebody said, oh, so what about a Roth IRA? And I, I'd never heard of one. And I remember thinking like, Roth is a, is a Jewish name. What, 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 what are they doing here? I had no clue what it was. So... Now I'm looking back at those kinds of gaps that, it, you know, and, you know, a lot of it you can say is in the bad, bad thing. That community had a system of taking care of each other. You know, they, they medical bills, you know, are, are taken care of. You're there. You don't have to think about it. And now I need to kind of find those gaps at a much later stage. And talking about that also requires me, you know, the, the line you said, you know, it's not my story to tell, but. You know, I'm telling the story of my mother's finances, the finances of people in my family. And even as I talk about that now, it's kind of like a second round of that experience. You know, I think my first round of thinking the impact the community has and undoing it has been the education part and kind of just the pop culture knowledge. I felt like I did, everybody was talking about things I had no clue and I had to like make up for it and learn it. And now is how do you build an adult life outside of a community that completely supports its own and has its network? And, you know, when you get married, they set you up on what you need. And if, you know, there's different people you can talk to and set up. And that's a whole level of unlearning and far less of a, of a boogeyman that I can point to. But, you know, something I didn't even predict would happen because I, I thought, OK, that you just you didn't tell me about the world. But in essence, they created a world for themselves that is good, that if you think about the way, you know, the, the elderly or the way um, the vulnerable, at least physically, mental health is different, are taken care of. I mean, I don't you know, that's awesome. I think more people would want that. I think right. it comes at a price, um, a price I'm not willing to pay. Um, I think it comes with a strong sense of there has to be someone who is the other by you to be able to describe so broadly who is in your circle. But they, they build that thing. And now I am outside of it. And I don't know, you know, it's, it's, not, a, it, it's not the same tools that I had the first time, which is, you know, anger and you know very righteous anger of what was stolen from me what was done the wrong way i think they just solved a different societal ill differently and i i need to figure out the other way that everyone's doing and it, it honestly it feels almost 
I don't, you know, I, I'm a bit more confident nowadays and I have my world, but that, that learning curve feels kind of, kind of new. And, and, you know, it might be true for everyone. I, I don't know. I mean, it, it is and it isn't. Um, you know, you're, I think you're absolutely right when you touch on the allure, even outside of a level of coercion or control, the allure of a very tight knit and um, sort of um, interlocking uh, community that cares for one another, especially um, elders, is very appealing in an American society that is increasingly atomized. I mean, there's endless literature on how the nuclear family is like the worst thing to happen to American society and mental health and all of that stuff. And I think that's terrible, right? Like, I I definitely think that that's probably another contributing factor to, um, you know, becoming part of extremist or isolated communities is, is seems to be ramping in popularity. But I think the the financial learning curve that you're talking about, you know, we speak our to, um, I would say probably like 85 to 90% women, depending on our platform, um, from all over um, the spectrum in terms of backgrounds and upbringings and what have you. But what's probably, um, not even probably, what's statistically most consistent amongst women, including women who have um, advanced degrees, who um, have higher than average salaries, is that they were raised, um, almost universally without real financial education, most women, um, and we're talking even now about secular women, um, don't control their long-term finances until, uh, married women, until the case of uh, death or divorce, um, death of a spouse or divorce. Um, and again, this is even, these statistics hold up for women who out-earn their spouses. Um, there's also all kinds of statistics around, um, you know, uh, women earning more in a relationship causing all kinds of problems. Um, so, so even kind of decoupled from a very strict religious upbringing or from um, education generally kind of being blocked out, um, we see a world in which women are still very much, um, I think, quite frankly, that money is used as a tool of control and coercion for women. Um, you know, it's obviously not nearly to the same extent, but, you know, a woman gets married and has children and her earning potential is diminished and the weight of childbearing and child rearing becomes, um, you know, an enormous obstacle for most professional careers because we don't accommodate even just sort of the physicality and the biology of, of women um, in that same way. So I think the learning curve, most of the women who come to us, and these are women who are out of college for the most part, they come to us with almost no financial education, um, having similar questions about like who's Roth, you know, um, uh, and and not really even understanding that saving for retirement is something that they should be in charge of. Um, so I do think that, interestingly, you know, I would say the isolation that people coming from extremely insular communities experience, I think obviously a huge part of it is financial, but I think the professional aspect of not being able to earn a, a living um, comprehensively, I mean, it sounds like you basically self-taught English through reading yeah. Willy Wonka and a, and a dictionary <laughs> yes. at the same time, which I love, I stand. Um, but I can only assume from that anecdote that a lot of men grow up not really speaking English very well in oh. your community. Oh, yeah, not, not at all. I mean, so until age 13, just because to satisfy some government things, you have an hour and a half what we call English. It should be secular studies, but just because a person shows up and speaks English to us and we don't follow much. And it's the end of the day and it's not particularly serious. And you learn about, I would say, arithmetic till about multiplication, I would say. Um, you learn the alphabet, but you know, you can just enough to like go to a store and say, you know, how much is this? But you can't really read a New York Times article. Um, no one can. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, oh, the horror. Um, I always thought that one of the reasons, you know, for, for the few people who do kind of, you know, learn English over time, they hear it around, you know, if you have more, uh, more sisters, you maybe hear it a little bit more. I always thought, you know, maybe that's why the New York Post becomes more popular, because I think their English is a little bit <laughs> more, <laughs> more, uh, this is my very snobby ivory tower. Uh, uh, opinion um but yeah you really don't speak english at all i mean you don't have a working um uh, fluency of of it um yeah i i couldn't until you, you know there were times when i look back and it i was like okay it couldn't have been that bad 
And then recently I found these like videotapes that I like because I I I was I discovered movies when I was 13, which I've never seen. We had no movies, no television. And I saw uh everybody has one bad uncle. So I had one bad uncle who like would sneak in movies and saw Life is Beautiful. Wow. And I remember going to him and I was like, well, why don't they follow me? Maybe something interesting will happen to me. And he was like, well, there's this concept of actors and cameras. And I was like blown away by it. So I, I became like completely <laughs> obsessed with it. So this is a random side story. So I I saved some of my money from like Hanukkah and Purim when you get money and got a, a, a video camera. And then the Jewish community center in Manhattan, I found that had a film class, but I was in Yeshiva full time. So I told the, the principal, I said, I need to leave every Monday. And I had my eyes downcast and I said, I kind of need to do it. And he looked at me and he said, is it better you don't tell me what it's about? I said, yes. <laughs> and I left and I took a lot of film classes. And he assumed because my parents divorced that I, there was some issues there. So it worked for me. So I did a lot of like secret, like filming. And I was looking at some of the way I spoke and like my English was bad and way more accented than it is now. So I think I forgot. I mean, I also learned full English from reading. So I mispronounced words terribly. Um, I still remember like melancholy and all a bunch of other ones like that. I really, Um, we, the people need to see these videos. They sound adorable. (laughs) Yeah, I'm I'm trying. I mean, I I edited some, put them on my YouTube channel. I I mean, I have no clue what to do with them. I have like 18 hours. I mean, most of it is me secretly setting up the camera, doing a walk. And I'll think of something. I don't know. I mean, there, I was, once I put it out, two different producers contacted me, but I've, I've had experiences with media and I think, I don't know if other people can speak to it, but uh, at this point, I, I really want to control the stories I put out um, and the narratives. So I'll, I'll, I'll do something with it just because I think it is a, it is a unique perspective, but I, I just haven't decided. Anyway, if somebody has an idea, I mean, I, I think I can just, you know, I suppose put them out, but I, you know, I, I, I'm thinking of some ways to do it to, again, to tell a certain story that, you know, and honestly, I, got, I really was excited when you reached out to me because as you see from my answers, I'm still thinking through the financial implications of it. And I, I don't remember there being a lot of conversations on it directly. So, you know, one of the things I'm thinking about a lot now, looking back at, I guess, my trajectory or my story and looking back, I was looking back at the tapes is the first thing when people see it, they always talk about, you know, bravery or you must have been so brave or, or then, you know, I'll, I'll take, I'll take some credit for that. But when I look at it, I see a lot of the things I did that now have implications that I, that are still in my life, even though I don't need them anymore. You know, I, my, my research in immunology is in inflammation. And I always say that I think it applies for things outside of life that most things that goes wrong are either because you didn't defend yourself or before because you defended yourself too much. Mm-hmm. And that's true in the immune system, right? You either you are too vulnerable or you have autoimmune disease or COVID is when your immune system really goes into overdrive. And I think a lot of it is also true for psychologically. I think, you know, even money, you know, I my we didn't touch on this, but my parents' divorce was super messy um, financially. And I, I just saw a side of it and it made me become obsessed with being independent Mm. um, and uh, not wanting money from other people and getting really suspicious of gifts and uh, kind of not wanting anyone to have that, be able to lord that over me, just seeing my friends and how finances always came in. So when I think about, you know, if I were to, when I think about the tapes I have um, or, or, or going forward, you know, there's a lot of things that are really brave that get you out of certain things. And then the habits you develop kind of sustain throughout your life and they don't always serve you if you don't address them. Yeah. If I, I, if I can think of that lens, maybe I'll put it out, but I'm still working through it. I mean, that's very common with people who grew up in um, serious financial insecurity. They learn to essentially hoard money as a defense mechanism, but then that ends up costing you enormously in your life because you don't do things like invest or, you know, other things take risks that would allow you to earn more. Um, So in terms of a final sort of overall question, not specifically about your community, this could be for anyone, including um, 
maybe even people who aren't religious at all, but for anyone who grew up in a very insular community or a very kind of closed off, even just family environment, who are thinking of going into the real world, quote unquote, um, and are very nervous specifically about survival when it comes to professional and financial survival. What advice would you give that you wish someone had given you? Hmm. That's so interesting. Um, well, I think, I think the biggest thing to get over is shame. Mm -hmm. um, you feel that you're, you don't, you know, everybody, and, and I know imposter syndrome and all of these things are, are not re relegated to, to those contexts. But I think the thing I wish I knew is everybody just wants a, can I curse? A, oh yeah, of course. I already cursed. <laughs> everybody just wants a fucking good worker, you know? <laughs> um, everybody just wants, and I think, I think, I, I think, I don't know, I, I'm curious in your opinion, this, I, I personally have found in my career now and mine, you know, in science, it's a bit different because, you know, you're kind of, a certain set you're supposed to apply for your PhD, you apply for postdoctoral fellowships. But I've kind of found that they really lie to you about the resume. Like they oh yeah. Like they tell you like, oh you're gonna meet all these criteria and you get a job. Like I don't think I've ever gotten a job because of a resume. I got a job because either somebody connected to some work I did or we yep. had a good rapport. And you know I certainly think that breeds bias. Um, I see it a lot, you know, I know when I was interviewing for grad school the fact that many old men in the, the department found me as one of them and they could banter. And I honestly think a lot of the offers I got was because of that. So I think there's a lot of bias in that, but I don't think my resume got me work. Um, oh yeah. I, I think that's fair. Yeah. You know, so I think and like looking back, like, I think I, I, it's hard for me to say because I, I feel like I've been so lucky in, in, in so many ways. And I'm not, I'm not saying this to be modest. I think I, I do well and I, I work hard, but the kind of field I'm in, um, certainly, well, here's something I'll, I'll, I'll bring up as an anecdote. When I got into my PhD program at the NIH, they offered me an extra scholarship to get independent funding so I can choose any question I want to work on. So I'm not beholden to any grant. And I was convinced the only reason I got it because of my story. And they're just, you know, and I was like, oh, even in science, it's all about like, oh, do you know where he came from? And I was really kind of upset. And I spoke to the director of the program, um, a great scientist, Alina Ostrander. I don't know if she'll ever, um, <laughs> this is sidetrack, I don't know even over time, but she studies dog genetics because people have been breeding dogs for years for certain traits. So they're very good to study the relationship between a gene and a trait. And I went to her office when I first got to the NIH and I walk in and her office is covered in plush toy uh, dogs. So I'm like, oh my God, I used to work in them. She says, oh, I don't really like them. But when I started working in science, people told me that you can't, as a woman, you shouldn't have any plush animals in your office. So whenever I get offered one at a dog show, I take it in. <laughs> so I thought that was cool. Uh, she's a great scientist, recently elected to the National Academy of Science. But anyway, so I told her and I said, I kind of feel bad. And I was like, do you need me to write like quotes for a press release so you can say the word? And she said, you know, I grew up, my father didn't think women should be in science. And I did it. And I was convinced that every award I got was because of that. And, and I'm looking at her and thinking like, oh my God, like you've done incredible work on, on the relationship between what we say gene to phenotype or gene to trait, height, color, that kind of thing. So that moment was for me a moment to realize that there's going to be a point when people will just treat you as a worker and you will notice it later than the people around or, or as a colleague or as someone with skills. And that chip on the shoulder lasts longer, you know, on the inside than it lasts on the outside. And I mm. think a lot of people struggle with that. So I think, I think I could have given myself a break earlier. Like I definitely used my story in the beginning to get into stuff, but I wish I forgave myself and told myself some of the things are, You've actually become good at something. So I, I, I wish I told myself that earlier. Totally. I, yeah. Also, like, I feel I know who you are because that's why I initially followed you. But you don't like if anyone follows you on social media, they would never know. Like you're always tweeting about yeah. like 
poems and yeah. genes and yeah, stuff. Yeah, and part of it was, you know, for a while I was like, you know, I want to see if I can like get anything, you know, that way. Or like, I was like, the next time I'm like interviewed for not my past, like will be a big moment. But it was also for me to way of letting go, you know, I mean, the, 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 validation for who you are and the self come from a circle smaller than the one you reach through media recognition. And those things are decided by different uh, trends and interests. And, you know, some of it does great work, you know, people hear stories and they share and some of it is indulgent and you choose for your mental health, which one you want to do and which one you don't. Oh, absolutely. Also, I mean, let's be clear. This is America. Um, I can't speak for other countries, but here, like you play any card that you have and everyone here who is successful is to some extent an opportunist. And we, especially in our early days, but even to this day as TFD, many of the opportunities that we get as a business are because we're an all female company with a mostly female audience, which is very rare in the financial world. So that is a card that, you know, do I like the fact that we're like always in like a special auxiliary category just for the ladies? No, I don't love that. But um, at the same time, whatever, like I would, I, I do think that having a card and playing it is something that people should never be embarrassed about. Also for anyone leaving a really isolated situation or even really just women leaving any normal situation because we get no education on finances. Um, just remembering that finances can be difficult because they often it's hard to make, you know, given decisions on a day to day basis or to, um, you know, make the right choices or to even get into a place to be able to save a certain amount of money. But it's not hard. It's not difficult. There's not a, or it's difficult, not hard. There's not a lot of math. There's not a lot of complex formulas. Like it's pretty simple once you learn the basics. Well, Dr. Samuel cats um where can people go to find out more about you and what you do oh sure um i'm on twitter uh the twitter handle is the number two the letter b is the answer because you know the question cheesy um same handle on instagram instagram it's more for like my baking and my cooking and on twitter i usually talk about science the things i like the bachelor <laughs> other silly stuff whoa can't believe it took this long to get there our producer is a very big member of the bachelor nation <laughs> yes no I, I i love i love a good bachelor nation uh deep dive but you know always, always leave it a little opening for the next conversation I guess. yes exactly um well thank you so much for joining and telling a little bit about your very unique but hopefully universally relevant to some extent experience and thank you guys for joining us and I will see you next Monday on the next episode of the financial confessions. Goodbye, everyone. Mm -hmm.